Thank you for inviting me tonight. I'm Brian Harris. We're a small group tonight, so let's feel quite informal and feel free to interact and uh, ask questions. And if you want to interrupt it at some point, feel free to do that. There certainly will be a lot of time for Q&A afterwards, and we'll just see where the, the discussion actually takes us. Um, a little bit about myself, um, accent, if you're wondering where that's from. Uh, so I was born in South Africa, spent a number of years in, in New Zealand, and have now been in Australia for the last 15 years. Uh, people usually comment on uh, South African accent, or some of them say that they can detect a little bit of Kiwi in it. By and large, they don't say that they think it sounds Australian, uh, but that's just the way it is. Um, yeah, I serve as principal of Vos Seminary, which is a, a, a theological college which helps to train people for pastoral ministry, Christian ministry, or just for leadership in the Christian church generally. <clears throat> if you're interested in some of the courses we offer, and we offer things ranging from a certificate four all the way through to a PhD degree, uh, do pick up uh, some, some of the little prospectuses there. Um, if you want to be environmentally conscious, you can even take a bag and do your shopping at Coles and so on in it. Uh, and uh, it's quite robust and can carry your groceries afterwards as well. And you can advertise us for free. Um, and uh, yeah, do ask me about any of the courses if you're interested in taking them. Now, when David asked me to speak at this, which was really quite a long time ago now, uh, I had a, a book contract with uh, Bible Reading Fellowship over in the UK and was for, for a book that they'd asked me to write, uh, Why Christianity is Probably True. And uh, just to give a little bit of the, of the background, uh, it's, it's a book that's been written for people who um, wonder if Christianity is actually true, and they, they want to look at the evidence. And uh, its title springs off from, from uh, the bus campaign that's been run by the New Atheists, and if you are aware of the New, new Atheists and some, some of their work, um, they, they ran a bus campaign initially in the UK, but it's run in a number of other parts of the world as well. And it basically went with the slogan, there's probably no God, so relax and enjoy your life. There's probably no God, so relax and enjoy your life. And so the book starts off with this, this idea of probably. Uh, well, let's think about probably. Uh, is that probably true or is it probably not true? Where does the weight of evidence actually lie? And just tries to go about looking at Christianity and saying, uh, you know, what are reasons that you could believe? What are reasons that you maybe wouldn't believe? And it doesn't take a, a kind of a strong arm approach. It doesn't come in and kind of say, <clears throat> you know, there's no question about it. Christianity is definitely true. How could he even consider for half a minute that, that, that it isn't? It tries to consider very seriously uh, the three main attacks that are made by the new atheists in the faith. And those three attacks are number one, that Christia Christianity is intellectually vacuous, two, that it is morally suspect, and three, that it is experientially empty. So if, if you want to know what the onslaught is, it's number one, this is just intellectually vacuous. There's nothing in this faith whatsoever. Two, it's morally suspect, a much newer accusation. And three, it's experientially, well, like it means just boring and dull. So, so, so those are the accusations that are made. And, and the book looks at them and takes them reasonably seriously and tries to present quite accurately why people would say this. And then it gives another perspective and argues back and kind of asks the question, but have you considered, have you considered this? And in the end, basically finishes up saying, well, I think when you actually weigh the evidence, you're not going to say it's 100% to zero. That's not what you're going to say. But uh, weighing up all the probabilities, actually, there's a very good case that Christianity is probably true. Uh, and it tries to take that tone. Now, the rather sad thing is that since that book was written uh, and finished, actually, and was due to be published in October, uh, BRF, the publisher, has run into some financial problems. And because of that, they've had to cut right back in their publishing program. So the book hasn't yet been published. And in fact, it's with another publisher at the moment and will probably only now be coming out towards the end of next year. So uh, when I spoke to David much earlier on in the year, we were going to have copies of the book here and it was going to be very nice and it was going to be great. And as it is, it's still with the publishers and will still be about another year away. Um, I have written a number of other books, though, so uh, four of them are on the table over there. Uh, in the end, I thought, well, given that that book isn't out yet, maybe maybe in a later stage I'll be able to speak to that book a little bit more fully, uh, and that I'd speak in some of the concerns raised in, in another book uh, which I wrote, and let me just haul it up here. <coughs> so this book here, When Faith Turns Ugly. And... So when faith turns ugly, looks at the reasons why it is that faith can be such a positive, 
life-serving force in the world, why it can do so much good, why Christianity actually in the course of history has done such enormous good, but why sometimes it can actually take a very different turn and really become quite ugly as well. So it, it, it explores those reasons why. Am I coming across on the mic or not? It, it, it is. <clears throat> so, so it explores those reasons why and tries to dig into uh, you know, how we can be sure that faith is actually a life-serving uh, thing rather than something that, that is draining, sapping, and uh, a destroyer of life as such. So if you're interested in that, um, tonight everything's just going for $15 because it, make, it makes it really easy. Uh, and if you've got cash, that's welcome. If you want to put something in a credit card, that's fine as well. So those books are available there. There, there are four books in total. The Se second one to maybe mention is The Big Picture. A point that I'll be making in passing tonight is that many people um, reject the Christian faith because they don't actually understand it. So it's, it's quite poorly understood. People have caricatures of it. And that one of the most important things that we can do as apologists, and I imagine that, that, that most of the people in the room here view themselves as apologists or budding apologists at any rate, uh, one of the most important things that we can do is to have a genuinely robust understanding of the Christian faith. Because in the course of history, uh, we have sometimes defended things that have been simply indefensible. Uh, you take, for example, uh, the, the, the tremendously disappointing uh, performance of the church when Copernicus and Galileo uh, proposed that rather than, than the earth being the center of everything, the earth was revolving around the sun. And you might remember, of course, that the church opposed that very bitterly and did, uh, well, didn't actually do anything to Copernicus because he, he died shortly after putting his, his theory forward, but did arrest Galileo, had him under house arrest for many years, uh, and made his life very miserable. And you've got to say, why did they do that? Well, they did that because they read the Psalms and because the psalmist says, uh, the earth is set on sure foundations, it will not be moved. The earth is set on sure foundations, it will not be moved. And so church leaders in that day uh, rose up against Galileo and Copernicus and said, the Bible says the, church is, the, the world is set on sure foundations, it will not be moved. Oh my goodness, you know. Talk about not understanding po poetry. Talk about not actually understanding the meaning behind the text. Talk about getting the genre completely confused. Uh, and so, so the church actually did some terrible things because it didn't understand its own book very well and didn't read its own book very well and started to, to read things in a really unhelpful way. And, and I guess that that's something of the heartbeat behind the big picture, saying let's just be quite clear what it is that the Christian faith does stand for. Because if you're going to defend it, defend the right thing, rather than defending things like the earth doesn't revolve around the sun because the psalmist says uh, the world is set in sure foundations, it will not be moved. Um, so that's the heartbeat behind, behind that book. Any questions that, that you've got at this point? We, as I say, we're just a small group tonight, so feel very free to ask anything or if you want to know where we're going to go. Um, Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a statistician, but you know, with the probability of life elsewhere, does Christianity support that? I don't think it does. No, it doesn't necessarily not. So, so again, I mean, you've got this intriguing question, this little statement by Jesus, that he has, has uh, you know, peop other people whom he has not yet gone to. It's just a vague throwaway statement that he makes, and it's not terribly clear if he's talking about people who are not Jewish, or who knows. But, but the Bible doesn't ever say emphatically, the only place in which God made life is the earth. It simply talks about the life that's here, because that's our realm of being. But if it should be that there is life somewhere else, the Creator God made it as well. I think that I think that that, that that would always be the Christian position. So there is listen, we we don't know everything that God has done. We know that there are many realms in which God operates. If there is another universe, if there's a parallel universe, um, the only thing that we would hold to absolutely is God is behind it, um, and, and and we would hold that absolutely. Sure, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, so I think that um, you know, as a as a Christian apologist, I I, I would argue that, that the first thing you need to decide is whether there is a God. So, so you need to look at that that evidence. So, so the the discussion really starts with the 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 quest to, to decide if theism is a reasonable thing. So theism is, is the belief that God exists. 
Um, when you establish that, then you, then you ask the question now, is the reason that there are all these different religions and some say there are many gods and some, some that there aren't, is, is that because there is an innate sense of God that's somehow inside of people, but, but that their descriptions of God can get quite confused. In other words, they're, they're contesting views of what this God is like. So, so there is, I think that what the different religions in the world tell us is that there is a basic human sense that there is something beyond, that there is a transcendent other. And the fact that pretty much every culture, but I mean, the, the number of exceptions are minuscule of cultures that, that, that have been atheistic. I mean, pretty much always people have been worshipping animals and we believed in a God. So, so you, you've either got to say, has everyone always been deluded? Or does this universal sense of there is a God point to the fact that there is a God? And really the only question that we've got to ask then is, so, so which version of God is most likely to be true? Now, 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 now what you can't say is that they're all true. And you can't say that because, for example, um, in, in the, the, those faiths which believe in reincarnation, they, they believe in reincarnation. So you, you get born and reincarnated over and over and over again. Uh, and uh, the monotheistic faiths, Christianity, Hindu, uh, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all teach basically that you live once and then comes a judgment. Um, so that doesn't say which one is right, but it does say, any logical person will say they cannot both be right. So you can't have endless reincarnations, but actually you only have live once. That's, that's, that's contradictory. So, so in the end, you realize they can't all be true. They, they, there might be some things that you find in common that every faith affirms, and there are some things in common with, with many faiths, um, but in the end, you've got to decide which one is the most reasonable. So I think that usually one looks at, okay, so we move from theism to, okay, then what is the case for Christianity? What is the case for Islam? What is the case for Judaism? What is the case for, for Hinduism? And, 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 and you go through them, and, and you, you need to decide which you believe is the most robust. For myself, I certainly believe that the case for Christianity is most robust by a very long way. Um, yeah. Okay, so is that, that a bit of an answer? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Great. And, and any other questions or thoughts at this point? Um, yeah, just on the, one of the points that you made that uh, some people believe Christians are different from Muslims, mm. and some people So, and it's one of the questions I'm going to come to a little bit l later on, um, but, 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 but let me give you a brief answer. So, so, so there are two categories. C category number one is that if, if you believe that there is no God, so, so, so if that's where you're coming from, then some people say, well, if there is no God, introducing the category of God confuses life because it's not true. And so people live for an afterlife instead of living for the only life that they're going to have, which is here. So, so that, for example, is, is a Marxist critique, uh, that religion is the opiate of the masses. In other words, people dull their senses, they dull themselves to the pain of this world because they believe there's going to be a better one. But you know what? There's not going to be a better one. So the only world you can do something in is this one. And, and it's why very often, atheism, a, very, very often atheists will then espouse a form of existentialism. If this is the only life we're ever going to have, live this life really well. Enjoy it. Uh, dive in. But remember, death always stares you in the faith face and death is the end. So live in the light of that and you live quite differently if you believe that death is the end than if you believe that actually you're preparing for something afterwards. So some people say it's morally suspect just because it sets you off on the, on the wrong basis. Others would say it's morally suspect because they would make claims like uh, religion, you know, if it wasn't for religion we wouldn't have had all these wars that we've had. And they'd point to usually it's the Crusades and then they usually go into Northern Ireland and then they might pick one or two other religious wars and say, you see, look at all that, that, that heartbreak that's been caused by religion. Um, now, we need to take that seriously, and I don't want to trivialize that, but I would want to make a general comment that wars that parade as religious wars, th there are actually very, very, very few wars that have been genuinely religious wars. Uh, Having said that, many wars have been legitimized by religion. In other words, religion has been quite useful to legitimize a war. But if you actually dig into the reason for most wars, the reason for most wars has, has been just the usual. Power, nationalism, money. 
Uh, you know, if, if you go back to why was this war being fought, power, nationalism, money, all extending boundaries. So the Crusades, even the Crusades, which seemed like such a religious thing, in the end, it's about expanding empire. It's about power building. And what a wonderful way to legitimize it by, by having the, and God is blessing us. So, so you've got to ask yourself the, the moral question at that point, is that really the fault of religion or is that simply the abuse of religion? Yeah. Uh, and and I, think, I think you've got to argue that it's the abuse of religion. Having said that, you know, people very, very quickly say that religion has been responsible for all wars. Well, I beg your pardon. Um, the Roman Empire wasn't particularly religious. It was fighting the whole time. It was just straight empire building. Nor was Greek, uh, Greece, ancient Greece, particularly religious. It was fighting wars the whole time. Um, the First World War, Second World War, they were not primarily religious wars. Uh, not at all. Uh, so, so people very quickly say, you know, religion's been behind all the worst wars and controversies. When you dig into it, you say, yeah, some. Let's, let's pull that right back. It's been responsible for some, but to, to blame it all on, on religion, that's a huge, huge, huge overstatement. Now, at the moment, people are tending to say that not so much because of Christianity, but because of Islam. Uh, now, it is true that at the moment, I think that Islam is a very, very worrying faith, and, it's taken, and fundamentalist Islam has taken a very worrying turn. But to be absolutely fair, if you look at the longer term history of Islam, um, you would give a more generous assessment of it. Um, so, so even Islam, and I'm not a, please don't misunderstand, I'm not a great defender of Islam, that, 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 that's not my intention, but, but even Islam, you, you can't really blame for most forms of war, but religion is always there, something that people can grab onto, and they can use it to legitimize something, that it, but, but it isn't the reason. And, and I think that that's the point I'd want to make very clearly. Before you, you believe that a war is a religious war, just ask, isn't this about power? Isn't this about money? Isn't this about expanding empire? And isn't this about just grabbing hold of religion and saying, make us look respectable? And, and, and yes, religion can be done that way. And that's why, that, that in fact is one of the reasons I wrote this book, When Faith Turns Ugly, because... I think it's extraordinarily important that people who embrace faith recognize that faith can become toxic. So, so, so it's like it's out there. And if you want to misuse religion, you can. I mean, you can just make people feel endlessly guilty. You can justify things in all kinds of, uh, you know, religious language or whatever. You can do terrible things in the name of religion. You can do that. But hold on, does that mean that it's wrong? Well, I mean, you get the new atheists often say things like that. But, uh, you know, the point I make back to them quite often is, and what about science? So look at the harvest of science, the atomic bomb, the ability to, to, to destroy the world. Look at science. We now have global warming. Thank you very much. I mean, for science, we wouldn't have had global warming. Uh, you, you know, you can look at the harvest of, of the scientific enterprise, and you can say, this is absolutely damaging. I mean, the only reason... You know, the reason most people are anxious about the future of the, of the world is not religion, thank you very much, it's science. And so, so the new atheists come and say, well, you know, science is everything, we must, you, you know, must, must embrace that. But even as you say that, you have to realize that's not fair. It's not actually science's fault. It is the misuse of science. Ah, but that's exactly the same with religion. It's not the fault of religion, it is the misuse of religion. And religion, like science, like pretty much everything, can be misused. So what are you going to do with science? Are you going to say, let's shut down the scientific enterprise, have nothing to do with it, the world will be much better without it? Hardly likely. So why would you do with that with religion? It's, a, it's exactly the same thing. I think it's the one common denominator, it's people. It's people, people who, who misuse things, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so... Um, is Christianity morally suspect? I, I don't believe it is, and I think we need to look at the, the larger legacy of Christianity, which has been enormous. Uh, it is impossible to overestimate the significant good that has been done by adopting a belief that every human being has been made in the image of God. Uh, and if you look through pretty much every genuinely positive social change in the last 2,000 years, it has somehow flown from this conviction that people are made in the image of God and therefore people matter. Now, it is perfectly true that, that we have sometimes been quite slow to pick up on the significance of that. And so we sometimes haven't actually acted upon that, that as quickly as we should. But if you asked, why was slavery abolished? Because people started to realize actually every human being has been made in the image of God. And, and it is actually quite interesting if you go through the history of the abolition of slavery, that uh, one, one of the key debates that was held in many, many parts of the world was 
are slaves actually human? Uh, you know, and, and, the, and there was a belief that, that slaves were not human. But the argument came back very strong. But if it should be that they are human, then, they, then, then slavery cannot possibly be tolerated. Because if slaves are human, then they are made in the image of God. And if they're made in the image of God, you can't ever treat someone who is an image bearer as a slave. Now, sadly, in much of history, people genuinely felt that slaves were subhuman, just a, a branch of animals, and you could do whatever you like to them. But as the conviction grew, no, actually all these people are made in the image of God, so it is that, that the momentum just swells and grows, and slavery effectively is overcome. Though, I mean, we are facing various forms of slavery today. Um, so, so yes, there has been tremendous good that has come, come from that basic conviction and belief. And, and people often don't recognize uh, how profound the change was. So, for example, <clears throat> in the Greco-Roman world, uh, they practiced what would be called liberalitas. L liberalitas was if, if you were a poor person, you would do something good for a, a wealthy, rich, or powerful person. Why would you do that? You would do that in the hope that they would do you a favor because rich people could open doors. So gift giving or, uh, was always from the poor to the rich. Now, now, now we look at it, that society today and say, that's ridiculous. If you're wanting to help someone, it must be the rich who help the poor, not the poor who help the rich. But in liberalitas, uh, you give so that someone who can is powerful enough to open doors for you will do that. This Christianity starts to teach uh, not liberalitas, but 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 caritas, charity, kindness, goodness, uh, and that you do it because actually this person's made in the image of God and needs some help. And suddenly that changes everything. In fact, it's one of the key reasons why the early church grew, because everyone was seen to matter for the first time. But, but you have uh, people, philosophers like Plato, for example, the, the, the Greek philosopher, and, and people still revere Plato's name today and talk about Platonic philosophy and so on. Uh, Plato advocated very strongly, he was asked the question, as people sometimes were, uh, philosophers were asked many questions, uh, he gets asked the question, so here's a, a slave who is now, uh, you know, too sick to work, what should you do? Plato, without a moment's hesitation, says, leave him to die. Uh, when asked this question, so uh, here's someone who's, here, here's a poor man who's begging and needs help, what should you do? Plato doesn't hesitate for a moment. He says, uh, don't give him anything. If you do, you just prolong his life for more misery and you lose what you're given. I mean, there, there's just complete indifference to, to the plight of other people. And it's because it's, it's a world where some people are viewed as mattering and other people don't matter because there's no common conception that actually every human being has been made in the image of God. And so the Greeks and the Romans could, for example, take, take children. And, and very often did this with female children and just basically left them to die. Um, no conscience whatsoever, not for, a, not for a minute. Why? Because not everyone's inherently worthwhile. Not everyone matters. Uh, we make the mistake of sometimes saying that the Romans were wonderful because they brought us democracy. Uh, with respect, uh, you need to say that the emphasis is on the mock and democracy uh, because it really... Um, it was a democracy that extended to about 10% of the population. Why? Because you had to be a citizen of Rome. How many people were citizens? About 10%. So fine, you had democracy if you're part of the 10%. If you're part of the 90%, then sorry, there were no rights for you whatsoever. That's not democracy. It's not democracy at all. It's only actually Christianity that starts to, to bring these things into society further, further down the track. And it comes because of this conviction that every human being has been made in the image of God. So, so that's the, the much broader social contribution of Christianity to the, to the human race. Okay, why, why don't I get into my presentation as such, because I've taken a slightly longer detour than I expected at the start. Unless there are any other questions at this point, feel free. Okay, well, I thought that tonight I'd just do a little presentation called uh, Kamua Kamarai. I uh, lived in New Zealand for nine years, and uh, if you know, it's a Maori saying, which means uh, we, we walk backwards into the future. It, it's quite a striking image. So, so if this is the future, we, we go there, but you, you go there walking backwards. And what does the, the statement mean? I think it's a Maori way of saying, always know your past, 
always remember your past, always remember where you've come from. Uh, you, you will always be moving towards the future. Don't worry about that. The future keeps on pulling you. So, 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 so don't be scared about going into the future, but go into the future with the confidence of looking back at where you've been, appreciating that, but still moving to where, where the future calls you. And, and tonight I'd like us to think through what this means for the Christian faith. What, what, what does it mean for, for the Christian faith to, to go to the future, you know, but walking backwards into the future? And uh, as we do that, we need to say, well, if we look backwards, what, what do we actually see about Christianity? And uh, in fact, if you are note takers or people who like to remember afterwards what was said, let me just, I've got some pronouns of the, it's here, so three copies, one, two, so two, three, there we go. So when, when you look back to the past of Christianity, you see a faith that's actually extraordinarily robust. Uh, I mean, when you look at the start of Christianity, you, you've got to almost pinch yourself and say, how, how could this happen? How did this faith actually come about? And in fact, I argue that one of the reasons you've, you've got to believe that Christianity is probably true is because it survives against all the odds and actually flourishes and grows against all the odds. So, so, so the sheer fact of the existence of Christianity, make, it's, it makes you at the very least think and say, oh my goodness, this is, this is quite remarkable. But you see a faith that has been extraordinarily adaptable, resilient. It's, uh, you know, the missionary enterprise has come and there's been various waves and, and this faith just takes root in multiple cultures and is embraced by people. In the 21st century, it's become popular to almost sneer at that and to say, oh, you know, look at Christianity. It's, it's not an indigenous faith. It didn't grow up within the, the, the particular cultures from which it came, as though somehow that's a terrible thing and that we can only actually love things that are locally grown. I, I beg your pardon. It's a tremendous statement of affirmation to Christianity that it has this largeness that is not so parochial that it just fits into little local settings, that somehow this narrative has captured the heart of people from many different cultures, many different backgrounds, and at very different times in human history. It's, it's extraordinarily resilient, which is why when people ask the question, does Christianity have a future? I think the argument is, well, of course it does. I mean, it's had a, it's had a future for 2,000 years. It's kept on going. So in very diverse circumstances, of course it will continue to have a future. Uh, and so there's a robustness and there's, there's something that genuinely has impacted human history. And let's be very clear about it. The life of Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, whether you believe in Jesus or whether you don't believe in Jesus, what you can't dispute is that his life changed the course of human history dramatically more than any other person. I'm not sure who you could even give as a close contender. Uh, and in actual fact, if you're looking for a close contender, you would almost certainly have to say Paul, Paul of Tarsus, who became Saul initially, Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, because in fact the impact of Paul was enormous. And if you say who perhaps is the third contender, you'd probably land up saying Martin Luther. So, so, so you almost certainly, if you're going to look at the most influential people in history, would say the first is Jesus, the second is Paul, the third is Martin Luther. So, so if, you, if you just look at, at real impact in history in the world, enormous impact, this, this has shaped, shaped the world. Um, but uh, as we look forward, so, 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 so we look backwards and we see this faith that's incredibly resilient, uh, able to adapt to many different circumstances, lasts over a long period of time. Uh, but when you look, look towards the future, you do notice that we're moving towards what could be called uh, a hardening secularism. Uh, so, so when I think about the context here in Australia, if you just think about the context for faith, uh, the Christian faith, if you can imagine, and sorry, perhaps should have drawn this in a slide, but, the, but in the course of history, Christianity has been everything from a persecuted faith through to a very powerful faith, uh, able to shape, shape history, able to, to take control and to do pretty much whatever it liked. Uh, so the example I give of, of the Christian faith, hi, 
and welcome. Uh, the example I give of the Christian faith being in, in that position, uh, I come originally from South Africa, uh, and you might know that South Africa was, gets colonized in 1652 by the Dutch East, East India Company. Uh, when they arrived there, uh, they simply, because they came from, from the Netherlands, it was considered to be a Christian country, uh, they arrived there and they simply proclaimed that uh, you've got to go to church every Sunday. Uh, and so always when a rule like that is made, you have to ask the question, so what happens if we don't? Uh, Dutch East India Company was very, very clear. If you don't go to church, the first Sunday you don't go to church, uh, you will get whipped. Uh, sorry, let me get the order right. First Sunday that you don't go to church, your wine ration is docked. So you get less wine uh, for, 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 for the week ahead. Second week that you don't in a row that you don't go to church, you get whipped. Third week that you don't go, don't go to church, you get put into, into prison. I mean, you can imagine church attendance was very high. Uh, in those days, people went along very faithfully. Uh, why do I say this? Just to underline the fact that there have been periods in church history when the church has been enormously powerful and when it's been able to say whatever it likes and people have just done it. Uh, if you are an objective reader of history, you would say that, that in those periods where the church has been really powerful, the church has invariably also been at its least moral. Uh, so it's some, made some, some terrible mistakes. But the church has also been at the complete opposite end of the spectrum, where it has been persecuted, and it's persecuted today in many parts of the world. Christians are actively persecuted, and it's been like that right through history, and it starts like that. So were early Christians thrown to the lions? Yes, they were. Were early Christians sometimes crucified upside down? Yes, they were. Were early Christians, you know, painted over with tar and set alight? Yes, they were. Uh, you know, this has been a faith that has had many, many martyrs as well. So you've got these two extremes. We're completely powerful and we are completely persecuted. And at any point in church history or where, any place in church history, it's an interesting question to ask, so where is it now? Now, complete power, complete persecution. Australia, for a long time, it's been a, what we would call a soft secularism. So the state is secular. It's not a religious state, it's not a Christian state, it's not a Christian country, but it's been gently sympathetic to Christian causes. It's been supportive of Christianity being in the public space. What we've seen at the moment is that, that that's moving, and we, we, we certainly aren't persecuted, but we're moving towards what could be called a hardening secularism, where there are more and more obstacles put up to faith in the public square. And uh, there's permission, there certainly is permission for churches like this to keep open, but there's a strong, there, there is an increasing pressure that faith must be kept within church buildings. It's not for the public space. Uh, public spaces must be religious, religion free. And uh, perhaps that was shown up more strongly than anywhere else. I don't know if you followed the debate about funding for school chaplains, um, but that funding, A, it became very controversial. Why? Because it was said, well, the state is funding religion. Uh, so that gets taken to court, gets taken to court in Queensland, and it gets challenged. You know, how can the state fund a religious enterprise? We are, this is Australia, this is a secular state. We don't even mention God in our national anthem. You know, most countries do, we don't. We're a secular state, thank you very much. Um, but the court throws it out, uh, and Christians, I think, perhaps a little naively celebrate that victory. Uh, why do I say naively? Because the court threw it out because it said, actually, chaplaincy has got nothing to do with religion. It's about you know, counseling and supporting people and everything else. Therefore, it can go ahead. Was that a sign of a softening secularism or hardening secularism? Some people say, oh, that's great, the society is softening and saying we'll actually pay chaplains. No, 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 let's, let's recognize what happened was we'll pay chaplains, but only if we say chaplains have got nothing to do with religion and that they effectively are social workers. Now that's redefining chaplaincy, thank you very much. And it's actually giving, it's saying you have to have a secular chaplaincy. Uh, and that's what a hardening secularism is about. Uh, so if you're in the public service, uh, you'll find that there's, for example, just ever such silly things, but they, they're very real things. Comes Christmas time, yes, you can send out Christmas cards. No, no, sorry, they're not Christmas cards. They're cards that can say season's greetings or festive greetings or anything so long as the name of Christ is not mentioned. So you can't say Christ Mass because when you say Christmas, you're saying the Mass for Christ, the celebration of the Messiah. And if you're saying the celebration of the Messiah, well, then you're saying to people that they should be celebrating Christ's birth. And sorry, we're a secular state, you can't say that. So just remove that word Christmas from everything. Thank you very much. Uh, 
I mean, it may seem trivial, but that is what a hardening secularism is about, saying no space for this in the public space. If you want that, you can go, go, go to church, uh, but you can have Christmas carols, so long as by Christmas carols you mean Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh, you can't have Silent Night, thank you very much, even though the theology behind Silent Night is quite appalling. I mean, I think it's most unlikely that Jesus was born on a very silent night. I'm sure he cried like any other baby. And, uh, you know, when the hymn says, you know, the Lord Jesus, no crying he makes and things like that, it's probably quite untrue. But nevertheless, uh, you know, we're we shutting down certain things. So... <clears throat> Because, you know, like our major public holidays mm. are about celebrating religious yep. appearances. Yep. So are they going to be truly hypocritical and continue like they are? Yep. Or are they going to redefine what our public holidays are about? I think they might. Well, so, so the 10 public holidays, three are religious ones. Uh, Good Friday, uh, Easter Sunday, and, and Christmas. Uh, I think that there will be increasing pressure to view it as another day. So, 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 so to name it differently. Um, then the, I think there'll be strong resistance to that because not necessarily because Australians are deeply religious, but because who wants to give up a, a public holiday? So I don't think that it would be very successful to anyone who suggests that we move from 10 public holidays a year to seven is going to be extraordinarily unpopular. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And in South Africa, so, I mean, it's, there are not many places in the world that would give you a public holiday and Ascension Day. I grew up in South Africa. I grew up with Ascension Day being a public holiday. It was a, Ascension Day is the day we remember that Jesus uh, goes to his Father and ascends into heaven. Uh, now, most places don't recognize it, but in South Africa, actually, it was recognized by a public holiday. I'm almost certain that public holiday has been dropped. It's, it's kind of just this little, just do away with things that, you know, you know aren't noticed too much. Um, and certainly, we, we don't preserve what we can do in these public holidays in, in the same way as we did before. I think Christmas might very well, because it's so close to uh, the, the Jewish, uh, names just elude me now, that Hanukkah, whatever it's called, uh, you know, there may be a way of merging everything into a religion celebration day, or it will be named differently, but a kind of a celebration of faith, or something like that, or spirituality day. Uh, you, you know, you could believe that that might be there, and we'll forget that it was Christmas. Uh, you know, if, should we be troubled if that's the point? Well, well let's remember, I said, said earlier on, that Christianity as a faith uh, had shown itself to be remarkably robust and resilient. Listen, if we stop celebrating Christmas and Christmas Day, from a Christian perspective, who cares? Because anyone who knows something of the detail well, no, it's highly unlikely that Jesus was actually born on, on Christmas Day. Uh, you know, Christmas Day was selected. It, it was a it was a converting of a pagan celebration of of the 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 end of winter. So, uh, strictly, that's the twenty third of December. Uh, you know, it's be, and it comes from the northern hemisphere. So, whilst our summer here over there, it is the shortest day in the year, and the sun gets larger and larger every day thereafter. And they'd always celebrated that for hundreds of years before. And Christians come in and they, they, they see this pagan celebration. And the resilience of Christianity is such that it actually says, as the society gets converted, we can't do away this public holiday, but it's not okay for people to be celebrating these pagan gods who some are given some sun god who's been victorious or whatever. So let's remember our oh, Jesus' birth. Why don't we why don't we celebrate this at this time? And so Christmas starts to be celebrated. So 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 Christmas itself actually starts out as a pagan celebration uh, that, 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 that 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 Christians actually convert, uh, you know, and that's part of the it's part of the brilliance of Christianity actually. It's part of the the, the reason why, it, why it's adopted. Yeah, yeah. But, but we don't really, from a, from a historic point of view, you haven't lost anything if it's not the 25th of December, because 25th of December, well, actually in the Orthodox Church, they celebrate on the 6th of January anyway. You know, it's, it's probably not either of those dates. Oh yeah, let's, let's move on a little bit. I'm probably taking a little bit too hard here. But uh, I mentioned that there's a threefold accusation against Christianity in particular at the moment. Accusation number one, that faith is intellectually vacuous. And if you're interested in apologetics, this has been the traditional um, breeding ground of apologetics, that people have looked at, at, uh, at reasons to not believe in God. And they say, well, sorry, 
uh, Christianity and, and they may attack all kinds of things. It can be, how can you believe in a loving God? Don't you see suffering in the world? If there is suffering in the world, how can you say that God loves us? Or it could be that, haven't you read the first three chapters in the Bible? I'm sorry, the world wasn't made in six days. Forget about it. You know, this is a nonsensical book. Or they might read about Noah's uh, flood. How can you believe in this? Or that, I mean, whatever people give us their particular reasons, uh, people say that they, they think that faith is intellectually vacuous. And part of the role of apologetics is actually to show that faith is remarkably reasonable. Uh, that actually it's quite probable. Uh, and usually apologists would begin with uh, the, the most obvious uh, observation of all. Uh, always start with the opening question of, do you exist or not? It, it's the Descartes, if you know, know the philosopher Descartes, he is plagued by this question, do I exist? Uh, and he comes to the conclusion, I think, therefore I am. Uh, I think and I know that I'm thinking, therefore I must be, because I am conscious. Or to put it in slightly different terms, I'm able to anticipate reality which is. So for example, uh, here I am, I'm sitting here now and I remember uh, I left some dishes in the sink. I can tell you now that the dishes are in the sink and when I, when I get home, I find that those dishes will be there. It corresponds with reality because I in fact am able to predict that which corresponds with reality. Existence must be. So I think therefore I am. And Descartes makes this as a statement, and he creates the enormous philosophical dilemma for all of us. If we exist, why do we exist? Uh, because this is the most perplexing question of all. Because clearly it is non-existence that makes sense. If you don't exist, you have no dilemma whatsoever. I mean, you wouldn't know it, um, but uh, there you'd be sitting with the nothingness that is, and that is perfectly logical, that there should be nothingness no one has an argument with. But we all know that there is somethingness. And so with that somethingness, you have to say, how come is there something? And you can really give only one of two kinds of answers. You can give the answer one, which has been the, the, the theistic argument and the Christian argument through the years. We exist because God is. God simply is the pre-existent one who always has been. Uh, and this God creates. So we have been intentionally created and brought into being by a God who has always been. That's, that's one category. We, we, we are because we have been created. Uh, and we've been in, created intelligently and intentionally. Uh, answer number two is, there is no reason. This is pure chance. It is accidental. And uh, this is an accidental universe. And the implications from each of those views are enormous. Because if I have been intentionally made, well, then there is purpose. Then I can ask the why question. I can expect there to be a reason for my existence. If I have to say, actually, I'm just accidentally here, philosophically, that has enormous implications because there is no why to anything. And I remember seeing this very clearly as a student, uh, as a sociology student 40 years ago now, which is a bit alarming to think. But anyway, I, I still remember my sociology lecturer, uh, Dr. Blanchard. Uh, coming and saying, uh, you know, and she was an atheist, and she said, you know, because we have been accidentally made, we just hear there's no purpose in our life, don't ever let anyone tell you that there's a reason why you should do anything. There is not a reason for anything. And then she said, for example, people say to you that it's immoral to commit suicide. How can they say that? There's no purpose in your life in the first place. If you choose to take your life, well, that's your own, your own decision. You are perfectly entitled to say, stuff you to the meaninglessness of life. Uh, there's no reason why you have to stay alive. And uh, our class, which was a pretty ruthless kind of a class, as students, uh, classes often are, knew that she was a fairly depressed kind of a person, and so said to her, so how come are you still alive? Why haven't you committed suicide? Uh, and, uh, and she replied back, good question. She said, I haven't yet found the courage, perhaps sometime I will. I mean, I remember that very, very clearly. I haven't yet found the courage, perhaps someday I will. Her point was a very simple point and was a, was a completely logical point. And the, the logic was, was absolutely crystal clear, albeit that it was ruthless. Because everything is accidental, because there is actually nothing behind the universe, because there is no purpose in existence whatsoever, there is no reason to exist. I mean, if you want to, it's fine. 
but don't ever let anyone tell you that you have to, that you should, that you ought to. In fact, just, just rule out the words ought, should, must from your vocabulary altogether, because if everything is accidental, nothing is ought, nothing is should, nothing is must, it was all accidental in the first place. So, so those two worldviews have very different consequences. If you begin with a worldview that says this world is created, then there is a reason behind it. If you begin with a worldview that everything is accidental, you can never find a reason in anything at all. Um, so within, within the debate, this is where we begin. This is, this is the bread and butter stuff of apologetics. Uh, is, is belief in God wishful thinking? Is it vacuous? Is it empty? Or is there a likelihood that there is a God? Uh, second accusation is that faith is morally suspect. And you might have come across this book by Christopher Hitchens, a book by one of the new atheists. Uh, God is not great, our religion poisons everything. Uh, and basically, uh, Christopher Hitchens takes the line that religion has done great harm in the world and religious faith is a, is a moral evil. Now, obviously, that's an attack upon Christianity because most people would say, well, if God is and if God is good, then you would expect that the impact of God's existence and God's reality would be that the world is better because there is a God, and if it's worse, well then, well then certainly don't tell us that this God is loving, uh, because that's been a negative impact. Now, I think that the new atheists have done a tremendous disservice to everyone by, by creating a narrative which makes it appear that the Christian faith has in history just done one evil after another evil after another evil after another evil. Uh, that's a very one-sided view of history, an extraordinarily one-sided view of history. When you evaluate what the Christian faith has done in human history, you need to recognize that this is a faith that is embraced by roughly two billion people. True, for some of them it's fairly nominal, but nevertheless it's embraced by about two billion people in the world, and they've been embracing it for 2,000 years. Will you be able to get some goss in 2,000 years with 2 billion people? Will you be able to get some, some horror stories from 2,000 years and 2 billion people? Of course. All you're saying when you, in fact, find horror stories from Christianity is that this is an old faith that's been around for a long time. It's impacted a lot of people, and sometimes it's gone wrong. But what you do have to say, if you're going to be fair, is you've got to say, for all those negative stories, what have been the good news stories? And those good news stories have been a radical redefinition of what it means to be human. It has been a radical redefinition of the value of human life. It has seen transformation in education. It has seen transformation in the rights of women. It has seen the abolition of slavery. It has been the, seen the introduction of, of medical care. Even in countries like Australia, which claim to be secular, uh, the, the, the modern labor movement starts out as a strongly Christian movement. And the welfare state starts out as a strongly Christian movement because people say everyone has been made in the image of God. Therefore, everyone needs to be protected. It needs to be protected by a social uh, a, a kind of a safety net that undergirds society because everyone matters. Um, so, so we live in a world that's been hugely impacted by Christianity. Uh, and, and if you don't believe that, you really just need to look at a map of the world. And you need to just, just color in those countries which have, in the course of their history, been most impacted by Christianity. And just look at that objectively and say, and which are the countries in the world where people, by and large, are wanting to migrate to? Uh, and if you look at migratory patterns and desirable places to migrate to, uh, there are maybe one or two exceptions, but in the vast number of cases, people are wanting to migrate to countries which have had a Christian heritage in their past. Now, you don't have to be superbly intelligent to, to recognize that the accusation that Christianity is morally suspect just doesn't, doesn't hang together when you say, and all the countries it's, it's really impacted are Surprise, surprise, the countries people want to go to. If it's been so awful, why have these countries been turned out to be so desirable? And, and look at the countries that people are leaving, and by and large, you say, well, sadly, Christianity's had very little influence there. Can you find one or two exceptions? Yep, but only one or two. Uh, you know, so, so, so keep it in perspective. This is the overwhelming narrative which has been. However, uh, we need to recognize that we live in a world where, number one, people say faith is intellectually vacuous, two, that it's morally suspect, Three, that it's experientially empty. By experientially empty, I just mean that people say, well, 
just bores me. I mean, you go to a church service and you look at this talking head from the front and you stand up and sing some dreary old songs and you leave and they ask you for some money and, uh, yeah, sorry, just not really interested. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and that, that's been the experience of, of some people and that's an accusation which is made. Um, and I think that for those of us who do apolog apologetics, I think there's a challenge that we need to be people saying that because of these accusations that are coming through, something in the spiritual climate of our day is changing so that it becomes harder for people to say yes to following Jesus. Now, now we need to recognize that some of the, the moral challenges are very real. So for example, if you look at the, the Royal Commission into the institutional abuse of, of children in care, of course that's, that's a terrible wrong. Of course it is. Does it make people hesitate and back away and say, oh, wow, I'm, I'm not willing to actually embrace Christianity? I, I understand that it would for some people. Uh, and then no, no one in their right mind would ever try to defend what happened there. But at the same time, it is important to try to understand why some things happen. Uh, so to understand something is not to defend it, it's simply to understand it. Uh, it is indefensible. And it happens not because people were Christian, but because they failed to act as Christians. So, so, so let's be quite clear that anyone who abuses a child or sexually abuses someone has not acted as, as a Christian. They've acted in violation of Christianity. But did that happen in some Christian institutions? Yes, it did. Why did it happen there more than in other places? Well, well again, actually it's because Christianity is the victim of its own success. If you look in Australia, for example, where were most children in care cared for? Well, the vast majority were cared for in religious institutions. Um, the state did very little. Uh, were children abused in state institutions? Yes, they were. Are the numbers abused in religious institutions higher? Of course they were, because there were so many more people in care uh, in religious institutions, because the church was providing the social network for society. So that's not to defend it, uh, but it is to understand it. It's to understand why that problem actually comes. Um, and do we need to you know, make sure that that never happens again? Absolutely, we do. Um, but it is sometimes a little rich to hear some of the new atheists kind of trumpet kind of moral rectitude and perfection and we, and we are the greatest people on earth when we actually look at something of the harvest of atheism in the world. So has Christianity done some moral wrongs? Yes, it has. And, and, and invariably it has done them when we have failed to act as Christians. You need to understand that absolutely with crystal clarity. Uh, what has been the harvest of atheism? Well, atheism as a major force in society has only really got itself organized from the 20th century onwards. And in fact, in the 20th century, it, it organizes really very well. It takes over one country after another country, after another country, after another. And you know them as the communist blocs. And you look at the harvest in those, and you look at the human rights abuses in those countries. I mean, we sometimes forget that, that significantly more people were killed by Stalin than were killed in the entire Second World War. The Second World War was a terrible, terrible disaster, but oh my goodness, the tragedy that happens in Russia afterwards. It's not insignificant that that's under an atheist leader, a leader who feels that ultimately he will, will answer to no one. Uh, but you can't just isolate it to Russia. You've got to look at it at, at, in terms of what happens under Mao and communism under Mao. I mean, that's a very different culture, and yet you have the same impact, complete disregard for human life. You, you actually take away the God hypothesis, and, and we, we answer to no one. And we have one life, and it's here. And if we have power, we might as well do what atheist philosopher Anne Ryan said, uh, you know, we, 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 we need to embrace uh, the, the, the strength that we have. And Anne Ryan, as a philosopher, said that, effectively, she said these, I'm putting some words in her mouth, but I'm trying to summarize what she was saying. She said, you know, if life has rolled you the double sixes, uh, why live as those rolled you two ones? If you are the strong, be the strong, let the, let the weak be left behind. That's their evolutionary destiny, uh, to be trampled over and to be forgotten. Uh, why hold the human race back by perpetually propping up the weak? Um, so, so you have those philosophies, atheist philosophies, and they get taken through and you see the harvest. And when I, when I listen to new atheists saying, you know, trust us as the new atheist, we'll bring about a moral order, you've got to say, how stupid do you think we are? 
I mean, really, you've had a century of trying, and these have been the greatest human rights abuses that have ever occurred in all of human history. And you say, trust us again, it will be different the next time. Really? On what basis? What's changed? I mean, why is that logical? Thank you very much. So, so what am I saying here? I'm not saying that Christianity has nothing to answer for. But don't be too, too defensive. We actually have a lot of extraordinarily good things to point to. Extraordinarily good things. Atheism has what to point to? Well, nothing, actually. Nothing. Uh, we've had its harvest. We've seen it institutionalized. Yes, they've been, and I'm not saying that every atheist has been evil, but by and large, the atheists that you can quote are just individuals who live their individual lives, and by and large, they were fine. But whenever it's come together as a cluster, whenever it's come together as a block, whenever it's come together as a force in society, the, the outcome has been absolutely horrific. Uh, and I think that's just an objective reading of the 20th century, and it's sufficiently recent for us to look at it and to be extraordinarily skeptical of anyone who's proposing some, something else. I've been speaking for a long time now, I've still got a, a fair way to go, but uh, you must be getting tired of my voice at this stage. Uh, what, what would you like to ask? What, what thoughts do you have? And I'll take something to drink. Any thoughts, any comments at this stage? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they always have a fresh page yeah. to speak from instead yeah. of promising a promise to society who have been, I suppose, that want to think about faith. Yeah. And, and it's important for us to remind people that actually communism and so socialism and its formation, atheism was, was pivotal to it. So Marx is not an accidental atheist. It is fundamental to his philosophy. For, for, for Marx, he reads how society is going, and he looks at the role of religion, and he says, he says religion has a toxic effect on people. Uh, it is because people look to an afterlife that they're not doing anything about their present life. Now, now to some extent, you've got to be sympathetic to Marx at this point, uh, because sometimes religion does act like that. In fact, if you look uh, in terms of uh, African-American slaves, for example, and you look at some of the, the, the songs that come out from there, if you can think of some of those spirituals, swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Uh, you know, I'm not sure the Marx ever quoted that, but nevertheless, it's an example of a song that, that is escapist. So, so here are slaves, and they're singing, swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home, and, and people are comforted because I'm having this terrible life here, but one day I'm going home. Uh, and, and Marx says, exactly, that's religion for you. It makes you satisfied with your lot. It keeps you happy, and, and you don't fight back against it. Now, let's just pause there. Yes, it's, it's easy to be a Marx and to say that, but actually if you're an African-American slave, it's all very well to say stand up and fight against everything, transform everything, but if you're just a private individual, I mean, can you really do that? How easy is that? I mean, some people are, are able to do that. Vast numbers of other people are not able to. Uh, and so most people just have to live within their lot. And cruelty to people, it's been as long as the human race. Uh, I mean, we, uh, crucifixion, for example, we, we always associate with Jesus. But uh, it's hardly as though Jesus was the only one crucified. Let's remember that the worst crucifixion in history from a sociological perspective took place of what was it, the 3,000 slaves who rose up and rebelled. I've forgotten just when it was around about 40 AD or whenever it was. Uh, and they get crucified in this, this, this line that goes on for over three kilometers where you just walk along and there's just a crucified person, crucified person, crucified person, crucified person, all the way along. I mean, it's horrific, you know, what we've done to each other in, in human history. Um, and as, as you look at, at that, you say, well, those were some slaves who tried to object. Look at what happened to them. Uh, so, so, so you can be like a Marxist and say, you know, religion is making you just accept your lot. Thank you very much. And if I don't, what happens? I get killed, I get crucified, I get whatever. Marx Haver said, okay, we've got to get people the courage somehow to rise up against their oppressors. 
Uh, and the only way we do that is saying uh, religion is the opiate of the masses, it destroys you, it dulls your senses, fundamental to, to, to the, the freedom of society is that we must stop believing in God. Now, now when we recognize that that's a fundamental tenet, this is the only way that this actually works, then, then you can't let people just sidestep and say, oh, atheism and that has got nothing to do with it. Uh, sorry, it's, it's a key pin. Marx's philosophy. True, Marx is dead before communism comes to, 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 to Russia, um, but it's fundamental to the system and you cannot divorce it from it. Any other thoughts there? Yeah. So, so let me make a comment on uh, social evolution. Evolution is a, is a sociological theory and evolution is a scientific theory. So uh, an evolutionary theory of the human race um, runs into many, many problems. So, so, so if you assume that it, because it works off the tenet of the survival of the fittest, so only the strongest actually survive. Well, well you're right in a certain sense. Um, because actually that is how society used to be ordered, and that's how Greek, the Greco-Roman world thought. And that, in fact, is how their philosophers thought. It's quite interesting that if, if you look for the justification of the philosoph of philosophies of people like, like Plato and others, it was actually we must have the strongest who survive. Because if we, if we look after the weak, all you do is you prop up the weak and you keep them going on, and the weak should actually disappear that they should be weeded out, which is the theory of evolution. So, 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 so you do actually get that, that being taught in a social sense. And, and you're absolutely right. Christianity comes in and for the first time says everyone matters. And Christians were noted because they would go to, to the rubbish dumps in society and pick up children who had been simply dumped there and they would take them into their homes and they would raise them because they said, why? Because every human being is made in the image of God. Everyone has value. So, so, so Christians, it's really only with Christianity that you get this first real confrontation with the social evolution that, that actually the survival of the fittest is not the important thing. It's not the guiding principle. Everyone matters and, and the weak and the vulnerable must be looked after. Society before was going in quite the opposite direction. Uh, might is right, and, and, and we actually celebrate that. And, and when you ask whether Christianity has impacted the world, you, you have to say, why did that change? Because we, we really don't think like that now. I mean, if you think in Australia, if, if someone is weak and vulnerable, and you, you trample over them, I mean, people are appalled at you. They, they're horrified. Well, thank you. Thank you, God. Christianity has actually made deep inroads into society. It's deeply impacted the way that we think. People did not think like that before. Uh, and, and, and that's about social evolution. So, so social evolution is a contested area. Uh, yes, I think there is actually some, some default in humanity, some deeply evil default in humanity that drives them along that, that pathway, unless it's checked. And that gets checked by, in history. That gets checked by the, by the Christian faith. Um, from a, uh, evolution as a biological theory, um, I, I'm willing to be agnostic about that. So, so I know that, and I don't know in this group here, there are probably people who think that evolution is definitely not, not scientifically valid. Other people would believe that, 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 that it is valid. I'm not sure that Christianity stands and falls on that. Now, now I recognize that people have often felt that if you read Genesis 1 to 3, that you have to believe that the world is made in six days and that you have to believe in a, in a, in a very young earth. 
uh, I think that that probably is a misreading of the text. So number one, Genesis 1 to 3 is not a scientific text in the first place. I mean, and there's no way that you can describe the creation of the world in, in three chapters. I mean, it's far too complicated and far too mysterious and amazing to actually be able to summarize in just three chapters. I think there has also... Oh, yeah, power fading, okay. Uh, we, we've also probably had a slight misunderstanding of what the passage is saying when it says God looked at what he had made and saw that it was good. Uh, we, and, and then he makes humans and it's very good. Uh, and we've read that and I think that we have usually assumed that that means that the world is made perfect. And, and people have sometimes said if evolution is true, then Christianity must be false because if evolution is true, then this is an old world and if it's an old world, then animals, for example, were suffering and dying when, you know, well before sin comes into the world. So, so, so that's been the, the, the problem that people have postulated, that if the world is old, then, then in actual fact suffering comes into the world before the fall has taken place, and therefore sin doesn't actually tarnish everything, and therefore the Christian story is, is mythical. And so, so that's been why many Christians to this day continue to feel that they desperately must, must oppose evolution. Having said that, that isn't actually quite what the, 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 the text in Genesis 1 and 2 is saying. It's saying that the world is good, and it's using a Jewish conception of good. So, so for a Jew to say that something is good, uh, or even to say that something is perfect, all they're really saying is that it functions. So um, let me give you an example. Let's just imagine the car park outside there. I don't know what cars are in there, but I imagine that as, if it's an average car park, there would be some old Crocs, and there'd be some beautiful cars, and there'd be some very expensive cars, and some in between. Uh, but if at the end of tonight we go to the car park and I were to say to you, you know, you know which of the cars here are perfect, uh, you might look at them and you may say, that car's perfect, that one looks seriously dodgy, that one's great, and, and you'd pick and choose. But if when we went to the car park, everyone went into their cars, turned the key, and every car started and every car could drive away, if you were Jewish, you'd say, that's good, that's very good. Or that you, you'd even go further than that, say that's perfect. Why would you say that? Because you'd say, actually, every car there is fit for purpose. It's doing what it was made to do. Uh, that's the Jewish conception of what it means to be good, very good, or perfect. So something is perfect if it does what it is meant to do. So we have interpreted Genesis 1 and 2 as being nothing was wrong, the, the, this couldn't possibly have been a better world, this is the most amazing place, nothing could be better than this. No, it's not saying that. It's saying that God looked at the world and the world functioned, it worked. And actually it makes humans and it works even better. So is this a place that still has tasks to be done? Yes, it is. So does that, con so does that contradict evolution? Not necessarily. Does that mean that the fall uh, has to be viewed as the first entry of human evil. No, no, the fall is about the first violation of our relationship with God. It doesn't mean that, that there wasn't a, a food chain, for example, because people sometimes say if there's evolution, there's a food chain, thank you very much, so that's not perfect, thank you very much, that must be the result of the fall. The, the Bible wouldn't view the fall in those terms. What am I saying through all of this? Um, I think you can remain agnostic in terms of how old the world is and whether it goes through an evolutionary process or not and still uphold the validity of Genesis 1 to 3 because you, you, you can argue it either way. Uh, if, if it turns out that, that it's a young earth, perfect. If it's an old earth, let me assure you, it doesn't mean that, that Genesis 1, 1 to 3 isn't valid uh, because in the end it's actually the theological statements that have been made there that are of prime importance. And the prime importance that's been stated there is that in the beginning God and that in the beginning God created. And so this is a, a world begun world. And, and it's of the two options, accident, or random chance, or creation, it's saying it's creation and therefore there's purpose. And, and that's the, the very key truth that's been affirmed there. Don't, don't know if that's a bit of an answer, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh, and 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 I, as I say, I'm agnostic. I, I, I don't. No, I'm not a scientist. I'm more of a sociologist, theologian. Uh, so, I, I don't want. And I'm dangerous to, of pseudoscience. So, so I don't want to become a pseudoscientist and you know qu quote all kinds of scientific stuff and be out of my depth far too quickly. But, but I do not see 
when I, when I listen to people speak in evolution, I do not hear anything that makes me as a theologian say, oh, panic, I don't hear that. I just hear, okay, if that's how God did it, that's, that's fine. But, but if it's a more literal reading of the text, fine as well. Anything else there? Okay, let's move on. I'll try and move a little bit more quickly through some of these. So, so we have this hardening secularism in the part of the world in which we live. Let, let's be quite clear, though, that a higher percentage of the world's population uh, claim to be Christian than ever before. Th this is something that, that often is missed. Uh, now, is the Christian church growing? Actually, it is. And it's growing not just numerically, it's growing as a percentage of the world's population. Uh, now, that growth is small, but it, it's, it nevertheless is real. And that's because the church has grown in places that's never grown before. Uh, so, so even when we speak about you know, being this hardening secularism in Australia and we feel worried and anxious, uh, let's be quite clear that, that overall it's a good news story uh, and that there is much that's positive and there, there's signs of God's fingerprints at work in the world all over the place, even if there aren't that many here in Australia. Now, there is a little bit of a worry, as I say, there, that in some of those countries where the faith's growing really quickly, faith is a mile wide, but it's only an inch deep. Uh, and it can sometimes be quite shallow, but nevertheless, God is doing stuff in many parts of the world. So, let's then try to say, so what, what does it mean in, in our particular context, and what are the stumbling blocks to faith? Uh, because if you are an apologist, um, let's remember that our task as, as an apologist is to say people come to faith in Jesus when they bow the knee at the cross. And when you bow the knee to Jesus at the cross, uh, that's... If, if the cross is the reason that, that, that you don't become a Christian, that's the only valid reason that there is. Because Paul talks about the cross as being a stumbling block. Uh, and it's a stumbling block because it's the place that requires humility from us, the humility to actually say that uh, actually I can't forgive my own sin. Actually, I am in need of forgiveness. Actually, I do need God's love. Um, now, if I say, sorry, I'll save myself. Sorry, I'm good enough by myself to get to heaven. Well, that's what I'm saying and I'm shaking the fist at what God has done, well, that does actually disqualify me from heaven. But, but if the reason that I'm not a Christian is because I had a bad experience of a Christian person, or because I misunderstand the Christian faith, or because I have an intellectual objection that doesn't really need to be there, or because I've been to a really, really boring church service, that's just not a reason to say no to God. It's just not a good enough reason. And so as apologists, we need to be very careful and we need to be really mindful. So why is it that people say no to Jesus? And in fact, an exercise that I'd encourage you to do is to, to think through five friends that you've got who are not Christians, five people that you know who are not Christians, and just try and answer the question, why? And then, then try to say, is that a valid reason? Uh, you know, and it could be that one of them is really angry because they feel that life has treated them badly. Or I, I don't know what the reasons are. But unless the reason is the cross, as an apologist, you have a task to do uh, to try and actually take away that, that stumbling block. And there are all kinds of stumbling blocks that there are. Let me talk about our own context and one of the, the big stumbling blocks that's occurred obviously very recently in Australian history. So we have the same-sex marriage debate uh, in Australia recently, and it turns out to be very controversial. Now, I obviously don't know where people stand in this room here. I know one or two of you, but I don't know most of you. Uh, but it becomes quite divisive. Uh, and uh, many people say, uh, you know, how could it be that, that Christians are saying no to same-sex marriage? Um, and I certainly remember the, the, the day that the results of the plebiscite came out. Uh, service principal of both seminary, as I mentioned. We were right across the road from Curtin University. I went over to Curtin University after the results come out, and you remember it was roughly a 60-40 uh, vote in favour of same-sex marriage. I uh, go to the university, Curtin University, and this poster is just everywhere all over the university. Love ones, love ones, love ones, love ones, love ones. And you realise, goodness, you know, if that's how this debate has been perceived in the wider society, that this is a debate between love and what's the opposite of love? hate. So if the church is on the other side, then presumably the church is this hateful place, and everything outside of the church is this loveful place. Well, you, you start to realize this is a stumbling block to faith, because people start to think, actually, churches are just full of hateful people who are homophobic and, and horrible. And you see it even more, perhaps as clearly, in 
so, so, so the previous poster comes from the Australian campaign, and the Irish campaign uh, used that poster, their vote yes, love thy neighbour. Uh, and it's an interesting use of the quote, isn't it? Because it's actually quoting the church back at itself. So it comes back and says, well, you know that you taught to love your neighbour, so love your neighbour and let them get married and love whoever they, they like because love is the only thing that matters. I think we need to recognise that this has changed people's perceptions to the church. When, when people say faith is morally suspect, they say because they say this was a justice issue, and the church wasn't on the side of justice. So the church might have had a great role in history. Do we have an have a ongoing contribution to make into the future? And this then becomes the question that people ask. And I'd like to, just for your own thinking, to say that it's probably important to think through when we defend the Christian faith, to think of what I'd call the three orthos, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, and orthopathy. So orthodoxy is about a correct understanding of the faith. It's about right teaching. It's about what Christianity actually teaches. Orthopraxy is about right practice. So we have a faith, but ideas are never purely ideas. They work their way out into action. So it's about how this actually works its way through and out in action. And that, 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 that's orthopraxy. And it's about right feelings. It's about orthopathy, whether we care about people in the right way. So... So let me just use an example. If you think of Jesus' parable of uh, the, the prodigal son, and if you remember the, the older brother who stays at home, the older brother had wonderful orthodoxy. He didn't get anything wrong. He did all the right things. He even had orthopraxy. He did the right things. He stayed at home. He helped his father's estate. All those things were correct. What was wrong with the, with the older brother? Orthopathy was wrong. He didn't really care. His heart wasn't really in it. Uh, there was something defective there. If we're going to be effective apologists, it's really important that we get together the three orthos correctly. Right teaching, with right actions, and with right feelings. If you ask me what went badly wrong in Australia in the same-sex marriage debate, is that probably the church was pretty orthodox in what it said. But in terms of orthopraxy, it hadn't really journeyed with people well enough, not long enough. In terms of orthopathy, it came across as being pretty uncaring. Uh, and like, so what? Uh, and we really need to get those three orthos right if we're going to be significant apologists into the future. Let, 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 let me give you, I'll just raise the head here because I'm deciding that I'm never going to get through everything I can, I've got here. So I'll just try and get to that there. Uh, Sean McDowell has written a book, A New Kind of Apologist, and in his book he tells a story, and he tells of, of going to his hairdresser, and uh, his hairdresser notes that he's been reading a Christian book, and so says to, to Sean McDowell, uh, says, okay, so what's that book you're reading? He says, oh, it's this book about it, and it's, it's a Christian book, and so she says, oh, okay, so, so you're a Christian. Tell me this. Uh, how can you believe in a God of love when we've got all this suffering, all this pain in the world, and people suffer so terribly, how can you believe that God is loving? And Sean McDowell said, he's an apologist, he's been an apologist for a long time, and he just knows this is the, the I mean, those of you who are into apologetics know, this is the theodicy question. It has very tried and tested answers. And so he starts to prattle out his answers to the, to the question. And if you don't, don't know what the theodicy question is, it asks, if, if, how can it be that God is all loving, all powerful, all-knowing, uh, surely only two of those three can be, can be valid. Because if God is all-loving uh, and knows everything uh, and is powerful enough, then suffering would not exist. If he's only two of those three, it's okay. So if, for example, God doesn't love, then the fact that he knows everything, he's all-powerful, who cares? He knows everything, he's powerful, but he could care less. So fine, suffering can, can be. Or if God is uh, all-loving, but he isn't all-powerful, he might be all-loving and all-knowing, but if he's not powerful enough to do something about it, well, okay, there again, God is off the hook because he just wasn't strong enough to help. Thank you very much. Or if God is all-powerful and he's all-loving, but unfortunately he just didn't get the news of what was happening and he was out of the loop, well, then again, God is off, 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 off the hook uh, because God didn't know. So, so therefore, terrible things can happen. But the problem 
you know, right through history, people have said is, yeah, but Christians claim all these three things for God. How can God be all loving, all knowing, and all powerful? All three can't hold together. That's a theodicy question. And of course, there are lots of answers to that. And if you're into apologetics, I won't take up a lot of time answering them, but there really are a lot of answers to that. So Sean McDowell starts to give some of these answers back to this hairdresser. Uh, and he's surprised because in the midst of his doing that, uh, she just says, what bullshit? That's the word she uses. Uh, what bullshit? Uh, you don't understand anything at all. And he says, just taking it back. Here's a woman with scissors right by his ears and everything else. And uh, just dismisses it and is clearly very emotional and very upset. And he said that as he thought about it afterwards, he realized, oh my goodness, I just went straight into the here's the answer mode. And I probably didn't actually think through why did this question arise? Why did she ask this question? And in his book, the, or in the chapter of the book, which he writes in the, the, A New Kind of Apologist, he says that, that, that he realized that, in fact, as an apologist, he should never have just gone straight into answer. And he said that in future, he's made the decision that when he gets asked that question, he will ask, he will ask another question back. Of all the questions you could ask about God, why this one? all the questions you could ask about God, why this one? In other words, tap into who the person is. Tap into what their life story is. Because if you don't know their life story, and you're just starting off giving answers, answers, answers straight away, well, you, you, you're probably missing where people are at. That, that's really what we're talking about when we talk about marrying orthodoxy together with orthopraxy and orthopathy. Um, because if those three don't come together, it doesn't work. Now, we need to recognize that people have quite often thought of apologists as being people who simply proclaim at an orthodox level. A little bit un unfeeling, just very logical, very dismissive of any human concerns because it all happens here at the head level. But genuine Christian faith is always about the, the marriage of these three together. Let me pause for a while there again and uh, just ask, then I'll probably close with just some thoughts in the early church and uh, in, in, any questions about that at this point. Yeah, it's about how do people ultimately thrive in the longer term. And uh, you know it's a very complex debate. It's not one that we can summarize properly done. And I recognize people might have different views. And and I suspect the church itself will change its views over time. And I think that it will. Uh, but uh, if, if one looks objectively at a number of places in the world where same-sex marriage has been legal for really quite a long period of time now, uh, you still find that rates of depression uh, amongst people who are in same-sex marriages are, are higher than, I think, I think the, the figure is something like three times the normal. And you realize, well, whatever you think about whether this is the right step or not, it clearly isn't a total answer doesn't solve everything. This is still a very, very difficult journey for people to have to walk. I was also thinking in terms of how the church loves as well, because the same thing as we give the child everything they want, it's not necessarily good for them either. Sure, sure. It's about the responsibility to actually say what God expects of us sure. in terms of our behaviour. So oh. love isn't just about being lovey-dovey and giving everyone what they want. It's yeah. often about often making the harder decision yeah. for us. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, having said all of that, let's remember, and you know, we spoke about Genesis 1 to 3 earlier on. Genesis 1 makes an amazing statement. It's right there in the opening chapter of the Bible. In the beginning, God makes, uh, makes, makes humanity. We're told that he makes a male and female and that they are made in the image of God. And that image of God is given to, to men and women. Now, now, what's significant about that? It's significant because it's saying that carrying the image of God has absolutely nothing to do with gender. Now, we're in this huge gender sexuality war at the moment. The Bible's opening statement is, but whatever about that, just take a breath, step back for a while, and let's remember that the most important part about you is that you're made in the image of God, and that has got absolutely nothing to do with your sexuality or whether you're male or female. Now, now, I, I worry that as a church, because there, there are a couple of gods in our age at the moment. It's the god of, of money, it's the god of sex, 
It's got a power and it's got a self. If, if you say, what are the four idols in our day? Those are the four big ones. Um, if, we, if we kind of get onto as a church, like this seems to be like a big thing about, you know, same-sex marriage is wrong or whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying it's irrelevant. I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but it's not the most important thing. It's actually another agenda that's driving us at that point. It's an agenda that says the idols of our age are money, sex, power, and self. And so bow down and tell us all about this and talk about this the whole time. Actually, the biblical narrative is a narrative firstly about our relationship with God, with one another, with creation, with everything else. And it's actually it kind of transcends uh, sexuality. And I mean, Jesus makes this very clear because he gets asked, asked the question, so in heaven, you know, it gets spoken about this this man and woman, and they've been bereaved over and over again. And so, so you know, when you get to get to the afterlife, whose husband or wife, I can't remember which way around, is, is this person going to be? Because uh, you know, they've been married six times, and this their, their their spouse has died all these times. And Jesus says, "But in heaven, there's neither given nor taken a marriage," which most biblical commentators take to to be Jesus' way of saying, actually, sex is not an eschatological reality. Sex is an earthly category, it's not an eschatological category. So it's not something that's of ultimate significance. If it's not of ultimate significance, we, mustn't, we must remember that it's not of ultimate significance. It's not insignificant. Because something is not of ultimate significance doesn't mean it's, it's insignificant, but it does mean it's not of ultimate significance. So we mustn't, we mustn't push it into that category. And, and I think that the, the worry today, and, and I see people... I mean, for me, the tragedy is that, that people make decisions about whether they'll follow Jesus based on, well, I couldn't do that because, uh, you know, you're not pro-gay or whatever. And you think, it's not an ultimate category. It's not, it's not in that league. Uh, the things that are ultimately significant are that you're an image bearer and that, you know, there's another eschatological reality and a new earth that's going to be made all over again. Uh, and actually part of that eschatological reality don't know why sex isn't part of it, but it isn't. Therefore, there is something that is better than sex. Uh, and, and I think we sometimes forget that as, as the church. We get too hung up. So, 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 so here are the nuance that I'm trying to give to it. I'm, I'm trying to say it's not irrelevant, but, but the world we're in is pushing it to center stage as though this is everything to us. No, it's not. Uh, it's just not. It's not the thing that, that, that we revolve around. And, and, and clearly it isn't the thing we revolve around because you've got Jesus who actually manages to get through all his ministry and makes no comment on this whatsoever. Uh, so, so again, it's not this irrelevant, but clearly it's not central. Yeah. Let, let, let me make, just as, as you finish off, I'd like, like to give a couple of thoughts on the early church. Um, that first picture over here is uh, the little dots stand for little centers of Christianity and where the church is known to be at the end of the first century. And then you come to the end of the third century and uh, where the dots are. And uh, though the picture isn't the clearest that there could be, you can obviously see that the, the church has grown enormously. And you've got to ask yourself this question, why did the early church grow so extraordinarily strongly? Uh, because really it faced... I mean, all that it had there was 200 years of persecution. So you have 200 years of persecution, and yet that's the strength with which the church actually grows. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of lessons that, that we can learn from it. Uh, and we need to remember, you, so, so you ask yourself the question, why was the early church persecuted? And there are a variety of answers that, that, that are given. In the first instance, the early church was deeply misunderstood, deeply misunderstood. Um, we know, for example, that it was accused of being, Christians were accused of being traitors. Why were they accused of being traitors? Because they refused to affirm that Caesar was Lord. Uh, now, why did that matter to the Romans? I mean, the Romans believed in many gods, and they had their empire, and they had to hold their empire together. And the only way that they could figure out to hold the empire together was to have a common creedal statement that went throughout the empire, and that creedal statement was, Caesar is Lord. You were then entitled to believe in whatever other gods you believed in, as long as you, you said that one, Caesar is Lord, because this was like the glue that held the empire together. Christians couldn't say that. Now, actually, the Romans made an exception for the Jews, because the Jews were never willing to say Caesar is Lord either. 
Uh, why would they make the exception for the Jews? Well, because Judaism, Israel, even though, though we think about Israel so much as being this great nation, in actual fact, in terms of the Roman Empire, it was just small potatoes, just a tiny little country, not viewed as all that, 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 that influential. Whereas Christianity was actually spreading right throughout the empire. So, so if it was contained, a group of people were contained, you weren't saying Caesar is Lord, that was okay. But once those people were spread everywhere and growing, and then, then, then that was viewed as a threat to the empire. So that's why the Roman Empire persecuted Christians, because it was viewed as being unpatriotic. But they spread lots of rumors about Christians. For example, Christians gathered together and they had the Eucharist or the communion or the love meal or whatever you, you want to call it, where they would eat uh, the bread, remembering the body of Jesus, and they would drink the, the wine, remembering the blood of Jesus. But word got out that when Christians gathered, uh, they ate the body of their God and they drank the blood of their God. And therefore, the early Christians were accused of being cannibals. And, and we might shake our heads in disbelief in that today, but it was a really serious accusation that, that went round in, in, in that day. Furthermore, in perhaps one of his less wise moments, Paul had encouraged in the letter to, to the Thessalonians that Christians should greet each other with a holy kiss. Now, you would imagine, if you know something about the ancient Greek Greek world, you would think that who cares that they were encouraged to do that? Um, well, actually, the Greco-Roman world was a remarkably perverse, sexually perverted world. Uh, I mean, every form of sexual deprivation was, was practiced there. Uh, we are rightly horrified by pedophilia today. Uh, it was rampant in the Greco-Roman world, absolutely rampant. Uh, and yet, this sexually depraved world heard that Christians greeted each other with a holy kiss, had no idea of what that meant, and so concluded that Christianity was sexually deeply immoral and debased, because they thought, this is seriously kinky. wonder what a holy kiss is. Can't imagine what that could be. This is really weird and really perverse. And, and so you, you look at the accusations that went around about the early church, that they were sexually depraved, that they were cannibals, and they were traitors, and you say, how did it then move from this size to that size over 200 years, even though Christians were quite regularly being, being persecuted? Not, not true. If you know some of the history of the early church, persecution wasn't consistent all through those years. And true, it was more intense in some parts than in other parts. It did come in waves, and, and some periods were more intense than others. But nevertheless, it, it grew very steadily. And really, there's only one reason that, 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 that gets given. And you, you find it, for example, in, in the thought of Justin, uh, Justin Martyr, a Christian apologist, he lived roughly 100 to 165. And uh, Justin was an apologist, and he gave all kinds of reasons for why you could believe in the Christian faith. But in the end, he said, you know, if you find that when you try to explain to people why they can believe in God and why Christianity is true, and I'm putting words into his mouth, but this was the essence of his argument, he said, if you see that their eyes are just glazing over and that they're not following what you're saying, don't worry, just live in such a way, with such kindness and with such goodness, that in the end people will say, this is amazing, God has done something for you. And you know what? That's what the early Christians did. Uh, listen to the man's name. He's Justin Martyr. You may say, interesting surname, that. Martyr. Uh, no, no, let's remember that people didn't have surnames in those days, so that was the title that was given to him because actually he was martyred for the faith. And in fact, Justin Martin put forward this, this theory, and they spoke about it later on in the early church, that you should distinguish between white Christians and red Christians, and white martyrs and red martyrs. What, what did he mean by that? Um, Justin Martyr said that white martyrs were those Christians who lived in such a way and with such purity of life that people looked at them and said, ma, those people are really good. Uh, red martyrs were those who, who went one step further and who cemented the goodness of their life by shedding their blood and by dying for the faith. And Marta, Justin Martyr put forward the, the, the principle, which is worth thinking about. He said, and never was there a red martyr who was not a first, firstly a white martyr. Now, now, now why do I mention this? It, it gives you a sense of what was happening in the early church. Here was a community of people who were living dangerously, who were living recklessly, who chose to show good to a society where the parable of the Good Samaritan was not a given at all. Uh, and, and they just changed the way that people thought. Uh, Tertullian, uh, who was another 
uh, Christian apologists live from 155 to 220, uh, looked at the question of whether a convert to Christianity could still be part of the Roman army. And, and this was a, a strong question for, for Christians, and, and Christians taught that actually you couldn't be part of the army, because how could you love your neighbor and then kill him or her? And so they, they, they taught that actually you had to withdraw, and that if you were converted, you had to stop being part of the Roman military. And uh, Tertullian answers this question, uh, you know, because obviously people are saying, well, how can I do that? How am I going to earn a living? And the usual complaint is, I have no other way of earning a living. The harsh reply can be, do you have to live? Uh, you, you, you know, this was a strongly committed faith that people actually were willing to die for it. Uh, and because they were willing to live like that, uh, and because they had enormous courage and enormous kindness, they actually changed the world. What am I trying to say tonight? I think I'm trying to say that there are very, 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 very good reasons to believe. I believe that Christianity has done enormous good in the world, and I believe that there's a hopeful future. But Christian people need to live, need to learn the lessons of the early church, to live with courage and to be extraordinarily kind, uh, to bring together the three orthos, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, orthopathy. Because only when we bring those three orthos together will we find a hearing in a world that has shifted, in a world where there is a hardening secularism, but a world that says it's not enough to say you believe. Show that you love. Show how much you actually love me. And because I have left out a lot of what I was going to say, I will quote with this, uh, I will finish with this famous quote by another Christian martyr uh, from the last hundred years, Oscar Romero. Uh, who made the famous statement, there are many things that can only be seen through eyes that have cried. There are many things that can only be seen through eyes that have cried. Uh, to be a great Christian apologist is to actually deeply believe in the truth of Jesus and the transformation that Jesus, Jesus brings, but to be willing to feel very deeply for those who don't know Jesus, who don't know the love of God, and those who struggle. That is actually what the early church did. They, they loved people in a way that people had never been loved before. And so in spite of ongoing persecution, every year the church just grew and grew and grew and grew. And if you ask me how I think the church in Australia will change around, turn around and grow again, it will be because we become a people who learn to love very deeply uh, and who love with eyes that have cried as well. And you know that it's often difficult to be human, but you know that God is real and that God is love and that God cares for everyone. And that's what I wanted to say tonight. Right. Oh, oh, thank, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, we advertise this finishing about nine o'clock. I think it's about twenty minutes. Where it's, you do okay, it's good Q and A. Sure, sure. Can, sure. Or we also can just sort of break up and formally ask. Otherwise, but oh, yeah, maybe at least a few questions or comments. Feel free. Anything at all. Sorry, what? What agnostic generally Well, the art of being an agnostic is that you actually believe that you can't believe. Uh, it's so, so agnosticism is, the, is looking at something and saying, I think that you can't make a decision about this because you can't be sure either way. So if you're an agnostic, you'd say, okay, that's the argument for God. That's the argument against God. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I'm just undecided. Now, I think it's okay to be agnostic about some things, but to be agnostic about everything, uh, and to be agnostic about the most important questions of all, that isn't really okay. So I don't think it's okay to be an agnostic about God. So, so it's, it's okay to be agnostic about, um, let me just use a silly example, whether you look better in red or you look better in blue. You know, you can say, I'm agnostic about that, I don't care. It doesn't matter, because doesn't matter, doesn't really matter. But to be agnostic about the most fundamental things in life, that you have to make a decision. Because there really are only two ways in which you can view the world. You can view the world as having been created purposefully by God, or you can view the world as being accidental. And they make such radical differences in terms of the way that you live. That to say I'm agnostic means to say, here's life, 
and I'm not deciding and I'm refusing to see that the answer to that question pulls me in one direction. But you know what? The moment I live as though life has meaning, which seems to me to be a great decision, but the moment I live as though life has meaning, I have actually made a decision because I said, I believe that there's a purpose. If there's a purpose, there is a creator because it can only have a purpose if there's a creator. If I, if I live in despair, then I'm living as though there is not a creator and that's accidental. Because if it's accidental, then it's accidental. Listen, you, you, you can be a heroic it's accidental, and that's what existentialism and, 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 and that philosophy is about. Where I look at the meaninglessness of life, I say death is my final reality, but I choose to live fully anyway. You, you, you can make that choice, but there's no reason why you should. Uh, there's no reason at all, which is why we tend to talk about existential angst, that uh, you know we, we, we agonize over everything, because actually we look that, at the fact that death stares us in the face. So. I think it is perfectly normal and natural to be to have an agnostic phase. So, so there's a period in your life where you've got to say, let me suspend judgment and let me just look at the arguments for and against. But, it's, but to be agnostic forever is not, not to face up to the biggest question of all in life. Well, 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 you'll live in such a way. You see, see, the way you live does give you answer, but you're not facing up to the implications of it. And, and you see, I think a lot of people are actually saying, yes, I do believe, but I don't take that belief to its logical conclusion. So I live every day as though there's meaning and purpose, and I'm actually quite hopeful, and I want to have children. I, I mean, some, something that I didn't mention is, is you know, we look at, at the growth of Christianity in the world, and overall it is growing. It's not growing in the West. Why? Well, actually, atheism is growing in the West. So why is Christianity growing overall? Because actually it doesn't matter that it's not growing in the West because the West is not growing. Why is it not growing? Because actually our population, our birth rate is amongst the lowest in the globe. Why is it amongst the lowest in the globe? Because actually atheism does tend to lead to despair. Uh, and, and it's quite interesting. The higher the, athe the rate of atheism in the world, in, in a country, now, there are a couple of exceptions to this, but again, if the exception proves the rule. Uh, by and large, you'll find that there's a, quite a clear pattern. Higher the level of atheism in the country, the lower the birth rate. Now, the new atheists try to sidestep that and say, oh, that's about because we're the brights, we're so intelligent, and we know that there are enough people in the world, you don't need more people. No, actually, philosophically, there's, a, there's another answer. Uh, if, you are, if you do not believe, you're over here, and you don't really have hope, and therefore you don't reproduce. You reproduce when you believe there's meaning and purpose. And when you believe that there is a purpose in life, then you say, this world is going somewhere. And part of my, my gift to the world is that, that, that I birth another generation. Now, now I recognize that, that you, know, you can't say that to an individual because they, everyone has their own story. And some people are not able to have children and I, I, I get all of that all together. But, but when you get the stats together and you just accumulate them, you, you, you actually find that in the West, as atheism grows, there is just less of a desire to, to reproduce. And we live for ourselves, and we live more selfishly, and we live as though I'm the only person who is. Now, now that is answering that question. You know, so we might say I'm agnostic, but when I live in this sphere here, I'm saying I actually think it's probably there. Uh, or we may say, actually, I get up every day, and I think there's purpose and meaning, and oh, I don't know if God is or not. No, no, you're living as though God exists, but you're not actually thinking through how that really can transform the meaning that you already have. And that's disappointing because you should. And, and, and I think that most people in Australia live, actually do live here, but it's disappointing that they don't think through the implications of, actually, you do believe in God, and I'll just take it a little further and let that develop and grow and see what that can do for you. Plenty of plenty of scientists that have been risen as devout Christians, mm -hmm. and um, you know, so obviously it's not mutually exclusive. Mm. Um, well, of an ultimate being one. Um, if that's the case, then how can you say like who who created well, like hydrogen, helium, beryllium, lithium, all of that? Mm. Or 
Mm. Stuff like that. Yeah. Well, well, I think that one thing you can say as an apologist, and I think it's a very important thing to say, is that the reason that science takes off and really develops, uh, and that it, it, you, you know you 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 look at its growth, is because the Reformation takes place and people start to think in a, very clearly about what faith means, and they start to articulate what they believe in God quite clearly. And as they articulate that, they start to say, well, actually, God God is the creator of everything. How does he create? Well, they're laws of the universe, and he creates laws, and the universe works according to them. And so the scientific enterprise you know, goes ahead because it's saying, if there is a God, there is a way that this God made the world, and he made it according to certain laws that govern the universe. And, and if, therefore, God exists, we would expect an orderly universe, and that's why science can take place, because we expect the world to be orderly. We expect patterns to repeat themselves over and over again. And so, so the scientific enterprise starts out as a, as a deeply faith-based one, that, that the world has order, and it, it looks like it's created, and it looks as though there are laws that are there. And, and that's exactly what we find there to be. Uh, and that's why science starts to take off, as people start to believe that, that more deeply. Uh, and so pretty much uh, all the, the early scientists start off by simply thinking that they're finding the laws of God, the laws of God created. And that, that, that we, so they would even speak in terms of, we discover these things, we don't create them, we discover laws that pre-exist, uh, that have been created by God. And, and when people say that science and religion are incompatible, they're flying in the face that it's extremely obvious that there are many, many, many very reputable scientists who believe very deeply. So if, if somehow you couldn't do science if you were a religious person, well, clearly that's not true. It's, it's extremely obvious that that's not true. Great, you've... Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a friend that, um, one of many has, but one of them is that she believes that, um, that the Bible hasn't necessarily been transmitted Uh, sure, sure. Oh, so, 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 so that's something we can actually be a lot more confident about. So, in terms of the transmission of the biblical text, um, listen, the, the the documentary evidence for the Bible is actually extraordinarily good. So, when, when you accept that you're working with ancient documents that were written over a time period of roughly sixteen hundred years by approximately forty different authors, um, then that, that, that that's a tall ask. But, but when you go back to, say, material that comes from that ancient Near Eastern world, uh, you know, is there anything that compares in terms of the, the volume of the manuscripts that, 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 that come to us, or the, the, the nearness and time to the events which have been described? There's just far more biblical documentary evidence than for any other event in history. So, so when we talk about um, the history for, say, the Gospels, for example, uh, you know, we, we have documents from the gospel that go back to the first century. Uh, the, these are written within a generation of Jesus having lived. Uh, you go to documentary evidence for other significant events in history, and you find that, you know, usually it's hundreds of years that are passed, and there are very few manuscripts. So there is there's nothing that is better documented uh, from a historical point of view than the Bible itself. And, and that you can make that claim pretty dogmatically. Now, it is true that people can come back and say, yes, but that's because we can't really know anything about the ancient world. Well, it's true. But, but be very sure about this. The evidence for Jesus is a lot better than the evidence for Julius Caesar. The evidence for Jesus is a lot better than pretty much anyone you can, can quote from antiquity. And there are just far more manuscripts about that. Um, it, it's, it gets to be a fairly te technical debate. There, there are actually lots yeah. of resources there. Um, you can certainly speak about some of them. Yeah. 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 So, um, I mean, it depends with so many of these things what level you'd like to go to it at. Uh, I mean, you can look at, say, if you want a fairly introductory level, if you go to the Case for Christ and the, the, you know, the Lee Strobel series, it yeah. deal, deals with, 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 with that question at a, at a fairly introductory level, but okay. it, it, the material that, that it passes on is actually yeah. quite sound. Yeah. Okay. So, what about like more? 
Yeah, so if you go to some of the stuff like FF Bruce, I think has done done some work yeah. there, and and you could go to some of his work here. Thank you. Great. Great. Okay. Well, thank you.